Well, good morning, everybody. Or da. Um, I'll begin this morning. I'm just going to reread a few of the verses that Andrew read earlier because we weren't recorded at that point. Um, I'm just going to read from verses 26 and 27 because I'm going to focus in on these two verses this morning and I'll, I'll say why in a moment. So it says this, Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So I want to look at what it means to be made in the image of God this morning. I think more so now than at any point um, do we as a church, you know, individually, collectively need to know what it means to be made in the image of God. But I think all of humanity right now, you know, this time there's so much hurt in the world right now. We need to understand what it means to be made in the image of God. And I'm going to do this over a couple of weeks. Uh, but particularly today, I want to answer these three questions. What did God want when he created human beings in his image, or as I phrased it there, to image him? Secondly, what does it mean to be made in God's image? That's going to be our key question today. And then finally, how do we image God well? So let's start with the first question. What did God want when he created human beings to image him or in his image? The short answer is this. He wanted an earthly family. An earthly family with him forever. He already had a heavenly family and he wanted an earthly embodied family. And quite simply, God created humanity because otherwise we just we wouldn't exist. It wasn't out of any deficiency of God's he didn't need us. He wanted to create humankind. He wanted something like him to participate with him on the earth, both to enjoy the creation, to steward it, to make the rest of the world like Eden. Remember, Eden was a very small place. It has very specific geography within the text, and it is where heaven and earth coincided but it was not the earth that we know. And he gives to his images, Adam and Eve, the, you know, the original humans, he gives them tasks. And he gives us tasks. And for humanity, it's for our enjoyment and it's for his pleasure. That's the original vision. And he has to do it because he, it's the only way it's going to happen. He's the only one who can create. Now, I could go into a lot more depth unpacking this question, but I feel it's the second question today is, is more important and perhaps a more difficult task. And I think it's one that requires a lot deeper discussion and attention. So what does it mean to be made in God's image? What, does it, what it means to be made in the image of God is something that I believe that most modern believers don't fully grasp. And again, because I think we are so far removed from the ancient Near Eastern way of thinking and their culture that of the writers that originally recorded the scripture. And I think it's vitally important that we grasp this because it will inform our identity, not only our individual identity, but our collective identity. In ways that might seem very obvious to the ear, but in our culture are anything but obvious. So let's have a look in scripture. The image of God has these characteristics. Men and women possess it equally. It makes us distinct from all earthly creatures. There's no hint within the text that we get it in stages, you know, incrementally or partially. Either you have it or you don't. You know, there's no growth or development into the image, you know, in a human sense in, in the creation. We also get that it's passed on generationally. 
Now, when Adam and Eve have children in Genesis 5, the children are in the image of their father, Adam, his own image. And then in Genesis 9, the language is applied to all human beings. In verse 9, it says, whoever sheds the blood of man, by, man's, uh, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. So he made humanity in his own image. And by this point, you know, Genesis 9, you have lots of people on the earth by this stage. And they are all images of God. Now, I just use that word images. You might have heard me use that term uh, before. What do I mean when I say images? Well, it's, it's actually quite important and we'll, we'll unpack that shortly. But this topic of imaging God it is central to what we might call Christian ethics. You know, our, the, the Christian position, the church's position on issues such as abortion, euthanasia, what we might call sanctity of life. Now, if I were to do a quick show of hands here and ask us here to, to, to show, you know, uh, how many of us are, uh, take a pro-life stance to these matters, I would imagine I would see pretty much every hand up. I would expect that. But why? Why are we? Well, you might think, oh, that's obvious. We're Christians. I then would expect at some point someone would tell me, you know, because we believe that life is sacred. Well, again, I'd ask, why? Why do we believe life is sacred? At that point, I imagine someone would direct me to this verse that we've looked at this morning. You know, Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that tell us that humanity is made in the image of God. And I wouldn't stop there asking questions because I then ask, well, what does that mean? And it's at this point that I imagine I would start to get what I would call this grocery list of uh, what we might call uh, attributes, a theological criteria of what it means to be made in the image of God. Consciousness. I imagine people would tell me sentience or self-awareness, intelligence or rationality. The ability to pray or commune with God. Emotions, soul, spirit, conscience, a sense of morality, communication. Most theologians and scholars that you will read that will land somewhere on this list. But there's a problem with this list. And the problem is that you could use nearly every, in fact, you could use every single thing on this list to actually make a biblically pro-choice argument on these matters of uh, euthanasia, abortion, you know, these ethical and moral dilemmas that we tie in with this uh, topic of sanctity of life. Because all of these criteria will fail in some way or another. Well, how and why do these things fail? Let's have a look. F first thing is this, because they cannot be said to be present equally among all humans. If we visit, uh, revisit that, um, that first list, does everybody have the same level of intelligence or emotional aptitude? Is everyone's conscience the same? What about people who are in comas for a long time? Do they lose the image because they are no longer conscious? Every single thing on this list at some point will fall in some way. You know, if we, if we expanded this to the animal kingdom, by which, uh, for which by the way, there is, there's a, a fantastic field in psychology called animal cognition. It's very interesting reading. You know, one study compares uh, chickens with human toddlers, and the chickens score better than human toddlers in an intelligence test. Now, if you let a chicken out at night, They'll find somewhere safe to, to roost. Would you let a toddler out at night? That wasn't the test, by the way. The test, uh, what they actually observed when they tested the ch uh, chickens and the infants, infant chickens master and develop skills that a human child would take months and years to in a matter of only hours after hatching. Even things like mathematical reasoning. So these criteria not only are they possessed equally by all humans, but they cannot be said to be present amongst all humans at different stages of human development. Some, like we just highlighted, they're not even unique to humans. 
most of this list that we see in some way or another is related to brain function. Except for soul and spirit. We'll get to that in a moment. But if we were thinking about, particularly when we talk about this issue of abortion, if you think about a four or six cell zygote, that is the thing that in a woman's womb attaches itself uh, to the wall after the egg has been fertilized. Well, that isn't praying to God. It's not having a single thought. It doesn't have a brain. It's not communing with the supernatural or the almighty in a way that, that, that humans do. Now, someone will say, well, at some point it will. And that's where we get an argument for what we call potential persons. And again, that's a pro-choice argument again. Now, I just want to pause for a second. Why am I getting us to think about this today in terms of what it means to image God? Well, we live in a society and a culture that is hostile to our faith and are looking for ways to undermine our faith wherever they can. They want to seek out arguments with us as believers they want to discredit our faith. And quite frankly, there are a lot of uh, atheistic thinkers that would destroy most believers in arguments if this criteria is the only riposte that we can give them about what it means to be made in the image of God. And they'd probably enjoy it as well. So these ideas can make us vulnerable. Let's continue. What about soul and spirit? The Hebrew word for soul is nephesh. And guess what? Genesis 2, 7. Animals have that. It's not unique to humans. Genesis 1, 21. Uh, the nefesh hayah. Animals also have a soul. It's obscured in our English translations because we don't see the word soul when we read it. But if you read it in Hebrew, it's, it's there. They also have a spirit. The Hebrew word is ruach. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3.21, most translations, it will just refer to animate life. You know, there's either animate life or there is plant life. But then we get in Genesis 7, we have this, the ruach nishmat haim. Okay, that, uh, and that's often shortened to, it says everything on dry land in whose nostrils, it will usually say was the breath of the life, but it's actually everything that has the breath of the spirit of life. And again, this passage, it attributes that all land animals, humans, and, you know, animal life, having it as well. So this list, this grocery list of criteria, they would all fail some way in this sanctity of life debate. So if it's not this criteria, what does it mean to be made in the image of God, and why then is all human life sacred? Well, let's go back to that verse again, the one in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God created man in his own image. That's how most English translations render it. Well, what if we think as the image of a, a, as a function or a role, rather than just a quality or an attribute inside a person, because as we discussed, these qualities, they're not unique to humans. Humans don't all possess them equally. And in some cases, they can even be perceived as being lost, you know, like the person in a coma. The image is something that's a function or a status. Let me illustrate why using some English language conventions, conventions that you'll also find in the Hebrew grammar. Uh, this is about the preposition in, okay? In Hebrew, it's the letter bet. Bet Salem, the, uh, in the image. That's the Hebrew you'll find in that passage. Now, if I say I put the dishes in the sink, well, that denotes location. You know, I'm talking about where something is when I say in. If I say I wrote this letter in pen or pencil, well, now I'm talking about, well, I'm not talking about location. I am talking about the instrument, the writing tool or perhaps even the ink, you know, that, 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 that it's written in. It's got a totally different semantic. What if I say, oops, I dropped the glass and it broke in pieces. Well, now I'm talking about the result of an action. So in keeps changing. Well, what if I said, I work in education. 
I work in ministry. I work in accountancy. I work in medicine. What do I mean now? Because the in means something different again. Well, it means I work as a teacher, as a pastor, as an accountant, as a doctor, a nurse. And it's here we get function or role, and to some degree as well, status. That is what Genesis 1, 26 and 27 are getting at. And if you want to look at this for yourself, then you can go away, look more into your Hebrew grammar. It's something called the, the Bet of Predication. The Latin grammar does a similar thing. Uh, it's called the Vet Essential. But function is a known category for the meaning of the word in. And it's both in Hebrew grammar and in English. So how does it work practically? Well, try to think of it as a verb uh, and an action word rather than a noun. Hence why I use the word images. Every human being is an imager of God. You know, God's original intent was to create creatures like him to essentially be him as if he were there. You know, they are his proxy, his representatives, his agents to do things on the earth. Every human being is an imager of God. Another way to illustrate this is to look at the Ten Commandments. In Exodus 20, it says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Most modern believers are taught to think that this commandment is some way about swearing. You know, the verbal utterance of God's name in some defamatory or useless way. Well, first of all, you know, if you read the second part of that verse, that God will not hold him guiltless, that's logically flawed. You know, if Joe Bloggs yesterday watching the rugby says to his mate, oh my God, did you see that try? What, God's not going to hold someone guiltless because, you know, they flippantly say something and, and, you know, to what God are they talking to? I don't advocate for using God's name as a swear word. I don't like it when people, you know, say Jesus Christ in a defamatory way, but it is not what this commandment is talking about. And actually, when we focus in again on the original Hebrew of this, the word for take, it's nasar. Well, it means a lot more than just take. It means to bear, to carry, to support, to lift up, to pick up. Now, if we look at particularly to bear or to carry, you shall not bear or you shall not carry the Lord's name in vain. The Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. It has more to do with being associated with. You know, I bear the name Christian because of what I profess to believe in. I also bear the name of an Elam Pentecostal minister. If I abuse my position as a believer, and particularly as a minister, or God forbid that I abuse someone as, some, as a person in a position of power in the church, uh, uh, sorry, as people within positions of power historically have done within the church, the Lord would not hold me guiltless. Because I would not only be defaming Elim's name, I would be doing enormous damage to the movement's name and its reputation. But there's much worse than that. When a Christian or when someone who is in a position of power within the church abuses that or abuses someone else, God forbid, then we would be doing damage to the name and reputation of the one true God. That's what this is about. You know, it's a serious, serious thing. Now look around us. Our culture and our society is damaged and it's hurting because of evil acts that people bearing the name of God have done. You shall not bear or carry the Lord's name in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Do you know, some people find it hard to believe in God because they're saying to themselves, how could someone who proclaims to follow Jesus have abused me in such a way. It's abhorrent. It's outraging. So to bear the name, it means to be a representative of that. It's important. Now, the New Testament expresses this really nicely. 
When Paul says to Peter in 2 Timothy, it says, The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who, name, who, who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Imaging God and bearing the name, they are two related concepts. In fact, they are really two ways of saying the same thing. You know, humanity was the representative of God. It was the agent of God on earth. To be human is to be the image of God. It doesn't matter if you're a few cells in a woman's womb. It doesn't matter if you're old and your memory's going because you've got dementia or Alzheimer's. It doesn't matter if you're laying there in a coma. If you are human, you are God's imager. End of story. It doesn't matter what race you are, what gender you are, what income level or social status you have. It doesn't matter whether you are Christian, Jew, Muslim, whatever religion, or whether you don't have a religion, whether you are Welsh, English, Scottish, Irish, Israeli, or Palestinian, you are God's imager. And for that reason, we should lay down our weapons. And I don't just mean guns and knives, I mean insults, hurtful words. We need to treat every other imager on this planet with the reverence and sanctity that they deserve as a fellow imager of God. You know, our culture, it has a habit of dividing people into groups. You know, we live in a day where the best word for it is, is tribalism. You know, we all want to be in a tribe of some sort. And as a result, you get fighting between these tribes. You know, it's, it's history 101. But yet, that is such a chaotic contrast to God's vision for humanity. And the fact that God actually tells us how he looks at people. You know, every single person God looks at is his representation. They are him as if he were on earth. But obviously we know from the account that gets ruined by the fall. You know, we entered into rebellion and now we have the problem of sin. Now we miss God's holy mark. We can't get there by our own efforts. We fall short every time. We're all in rebellion. And we need to be brought back into the family of God, where we can actually function like God wants us to do, when we can actually represent him well, the way that he wants things done. And that's, you know, what we're here to do as the redeemed, those who, who call on Jesus. But every person that we encounter in our life, they're an estranged family member. That's how we should think of it. They have been created for a specific reason, and that is to image God, to participate with God, to complete the task that God wants them to do, to give the earth the kind of life that God wants people to have. And it all goes back to Genesis 1, this concept of imaging, bearing the name, representation. And again, in a fallen world, the redeemed, the church, as Jesus' body, are the ones who can do this as intended. But as I said, we're all estranged from God. But thankfully, we have a template. And it's no coincidence then that imaging language is used of Jesus. So this brings me to our final question. How do we image God well? Paul talks about representation of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, the God of this world... I'm not talking about the one true God, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus, he's the perfect image. He's the perfect representative of God. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, God has predestinated that all who believe will ultimately be conformed to the image of his son. Now, does that mean that we will all look like Jesus? If I was female, I'd be a bit sad about that. I'm joking, but that's kind of how we think about these things sometimes. You know, we literalize these kind of things when we sort of envisage our future state. First John 3 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called 
how we should be the children of God. And then just afterwards, he adds this little parenthetical thought. He says, and that's what we are. And then later in that same passage, he goes on to say, someday we will be like Jesus and we will be conformed to his image. Paul then in Colossians says, believers have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And then to the church in Corinth in his second letter, he says, what a coincidence we, we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. To image God is to become more like him. To use Jesus as our example. You know, we follow Jesus. We imitate Jesus. That's discipleship. You know, you follow Jesus, you mimic what he did when he lived amongst us. And we know his behaviour, we know his attitudes, we know what he would do in certain situations because we have the gospel and it gives us an abundance of examples to live our lives by. And when we do that, we are being conformed to his image. Gradually, we are being turned that bit more into his image and he is the perfect image of God. And it's when we do that, when we imitate Jesus, that we are fulfilling our roles and our functions as human beings. That is what you were intended to be. It is what every person was intended to be. All in the same family, all participating with God in making the world the way that God wanted it to be in the first place. That's the task. So let me finish by asking us these questions this morning. Just bow your heads as I just ask these and then we'll go into a time of prayer. As we think about imaging God well, what are you going to do today to become more like Jesus? What do you need to do in your life? Uh, what, what do you need to surrender in your life? Or what do you need to repent or turn away from? How are we each going to fulfill our roles and functions as God's images this week? And finally, how are we going to mimic Jesus in order to point or direct estranged images towards the true and perfect image of God that we find in Jesus? Let's just bow our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you sent your son. I thank you because you have shown us how you want us to live, to image you, how you want us to go about our daily lives, to point people towards you, the one and true God. I thank you that you sent your son to die in my place so that one day I can look forward to a day where I will be back in your presence, in a new Eden. And life will be the way it's intended to be. But Lord, until that day, I pray to each and every one of us, you know, as members of your body, as your church here gathered in Bethai, that we would point people towards the true and perfect image that we find in you, Lord Jesus. Lord, be Lord in our lives today. Help us to surrender daily to you the things that we need to give up. Help us daily to take up our cross. Help us daily to imitate you. For you are the perfect image. And we love you. I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be continuing this next week and... As we continue to look at you know what it means to image God, we'll be tackling that problem of you know, suffering and evil. We'll look at that, but thank you.